Thank you for joining Wars of the Roses as we conclude with part 13 postscript to the fifth edition from Mystic Masonry by J.D. Buck. A postscript to the fifth edition, the original thesis of Mystic Masonry may be defined as follows. To show and illustrate the profound wisdom embodied in the philosophy that underlies and runs like a golden thread throughout the whole institution of Freemasonry, to demonstrate through this philosophy and its use, illustrations, dramatic representations and symbolism that the work of the Lodge constitutes a great school of instruction for its candidates and freighters in the real meaning of life and the basic principles of human conduct, so as to secure the highest and most noble results ever revealed to man. To render absurd and illogical any other inference from the references to and all that we know of, the real masters of the past and the schools and the greater mysteries of antiquity. Masonry seems to have embodied, crystallized, preserved and adapted to the present age, these jewels of all the past, divested of all extraneous or irrelevant matters. This is the meaning of the perfect Ashlar. The author was well aware that, but few Masons realized what a treasure house of jewels they possessed, and that some perhaps would regard such a claim as absurd and altogether fanciful. He was also aware that there are thousands of brother Masons who believe that there must be far deeper truths and more valuable treasures concealed than are revealed or generally apprehended if they only knew where to search and how to discover them. For he has heard this statement oft repeated by brothers young and old. Indeed, it is difficult to imagine how any intelligent and thoughtful man can go through the dramatic and monitorial initiation of the three degrees of the Blue Lodge and come to any other conclusion. To justify this logical inference, encourage the intelligent search for the royal secret, and assist in the recovery of the lost word was the original and only motive of mystic masonry. The author has been a mason nearly half a century, and aside from the study of masonry, its sources, symbolism, and essential meaning, has been able to check and verify these great truths from another source, viz. the study of man, and especially from the study of psychology. Here, the opportunities to test theories of life and the motives of conduct and elements of character really transcend all others. The physician sees like none other both the Ning and the end of embodied human life. From the first breath, often so anxiously looked for and evoked of the little one that out from the shore of the great unknown comes weeping and wailing and all alone. To the last breath of the aged just crossing the great divide, the physician is present, often nearer than any other and vigilant, observing, solicitous and full of deep reflection. It is his office to try to understand in order that he may apply and utilize then and thereafter. It may seem to some a startling and unwarranted statement that the most profound truths of psychology, the building of character and self-control, which more than all else safeguards against disease, paresis, premature senility and insanity, are all embodied in the very foundations of Freemasonry. But this is the simple truth. To illustrate and verify here would be out of place but it is a thesis easily demonstrated. Masonry embodies a science of ethics, of human conduct and character found scarcely anywhere else. And more than half of all our diseases come from lack of self-control and from selfish indulgence. Every Mason knows, and I am writing principally for brother Masons, that this government of which in spite of all its faults we are so justly proud, was inspired and founded mostly by men who were Masons. The truths that were self-evident and the rights that were inalienable were perceived in and by those founders as derived from masonry. They were transplanted directly from masonry to the Declaration and the Constitution, though we have not yet altogether realized them. This is why Albert Pike and others have called masonry the Great Republic. They tried to define the eminent domain, the reserved right of every individual, every citizen to life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. These inalienable rights were founded on self-evident truths before a candidate takes the slightest obligation in masonry, and as the premise of every obligation taken, he is given the unqualified assurance that no obligation required of him shall interfere with any duty he owes to God, to his country, to his neighbor, or himself. And he alone is to be the judge of these duties. These are his inalienable rights, his recognized duties, his eminent domain. Enlarged and elaborated, defined and codified, here is our Declaration of Independence, our Constitution of a Free People, and it is the genius of Freemasonry, pure and simple. It is impossible to enslave either the body, mind, or soul of man while these principles and declarations are strictly and logically adhered to. 
nor were the founders of this government of the people, by the people, for the people, either in ignorance or in doubt as to the danger point, for they proceeded to forever separate church and state as far as possible. The government was to be a state affair with which the church had officially nothing to do whatsoever. Rome declares in America today that church and state shall be united as one, and that one shall be the church. I hereby challenge every Freemason in America today to take notice of this sign and summons to the profound philosophy of life and the stores of ancient wisdom to which it was the original design of this little book to call attention, there is now added an imminent duty of citizenship for which the Freemason ought to be better prepared and more strongly obligated than any other for the simple reason that these duties and obligations are taught, ingrained and illustrated in the school of Masonry, specifically and concisely as nowhere else in the world today. This is why Rome hates vilifies and anathematizes masonry continually, relentlessly, and eternally. There can be no compromise. Shall it be church or state to rule in this free country? It cannot possibly be both. Rome today is the most powerful and ambitious political autocracy on earth, and she already holds the balance of power in America. I have said nothing here of the religious department of the Roman hierarchy. That is another story. The Mason who is untrue to the basic principles of Masonry can be nothing less than a traitor to his country. There can be no middle ground, no compromise. If the more than two million Masons in the United States today would do their duty, as did that handful of men and Masons who signed our Declaration of Independence, we should have a bloodless revolution and the Italian Cardinals who run the politics of the Roman Church would get out of politics so far as America is concerned, while the Catholic religion would have the same rights and benefits here as any other. No more, no less. Of what value or use is the wisdom of the ages if we fail to put its principles in practice or to utilize its profound lessons running through the whole history of man? Every just and upright Mason ought to know and to realize what he stands for, why he is a Mason, and that while his freedom is reserved, his inalienable rights were secured by sacrifice and can only be preserved by conscientious regard and discharge of duty. Eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. The greatest enemy of the Republic today is the man who stupidly or indifferently says there is no danger. This is the strongest asset of the enemy of all our liberties. Get a word of this danger into any influential newspaper if you can. They're all censored. Mother Church and the party are political slogans, pure and simple, built for graft and founded on greed, equally unscrupulous and menacing. I have not a particle of fear that any intelligent, just and upright Mason will deny or be able to disprove a single statement herein made. The facts are scarcely outlined. The fear and the danger are that Masons will continue to ignore, belittle or evade them. The present point of attack is our free public schools, the very foundation of all our free institutions, and the parochial schools are fast gaining ground. The most hopeful sign is the resolution recently passed by the National Teachers Association unanimously protesting against any division of the school fund for any sectarian body whatsoever. Nothing is easier than to demonstrate that the principles which Masonry so clearly defines and upon which the Lodge is built constitute the Magna Charta of this government and were thence derived. These principles are the pure gold of ethics and the conduct of life, both individual and associate, from the melting pot of all human history and the wisdom of all ages. This is why Mother Church, that is, the 60-odd Italian cardinals, arrogant, ambitious, relentless, vindictive, hate masonry, misrepresent it and continually anathematize it and would destroy it if they could, as they have murdered its votaries in the past. Masonry stands squarely across their path, stands for the exact opposite of all their political ambition covets and would gain at any cost to mankind. For with them, the end justifies the means. Not one citizen in a thousand realizes what immense progress this political autocracy has made in America in the 14 years since this little book was written. In Canada today, the citizens are trying to undo the work of popery and Jesuitism in the public schools, shake off the blight of priestcraft and regain their liberties. Read the Canadian papers and see, for they are not all censored. Of what value is a knowledge of history if we are never to profit by its bitter lessons and admonitions? Of what value is a knowledge of the basic principles that underlie all individual and social life if we are not ready to utilize them, live by them, and if need be, fight for them and die for them? as did the fathers of this republic. I can only speak and act as one man 
already entered on his fourth score of years and a mason for nearly 50 years. In many countries today, I would pay the forfeit of life for these utterances. And in this country, six deliberate attempts within the year have been made to assassinate one of my Masonic comrades engaged in the same cause. So far as publicity and our open declaration are concerned in this country, we have not yet made a beginning. But so far as the enemy of all our free institutions is concerned, scarcely a department of our government or one of our safeguards of freedom exists that is not by them already undermined. Free school, free press, free religion, all undermined by Jesuitry and paying tribute to Rome. During the past 14 years, I have advanced from the reflections of philosophy to the church militant as every just and upright Mason will ere long be compelled to pass from refreshment to labor or become a traitor to every Masonic principle and implicated in the destruction of every design on his trestle board. In mystic masonry, I have tried to give a glimpse of the jewels of wisdom, the crown jewels of every high civilization that has ever existed, inspired by their sages and wisest masters. Year by year, my convictions have deepened. The glory and beauty become more and more transcendent and the outlook more uplifting on the journey of life. Scarcely a proposition herein contained drawn from philosophy and symbolism and justified by analogy and rational sequence that has not since been confirmed by natural science and reaffirmed by the author of the great work. I undertook consistently to portray the qualifications that should constitute a master, such as I had not seen or known. A score of times I said to the beloved comrade, I am waiting for the man, and one day I found him. I find no incongruity between the logical inference I had drawn and the actuality I had discovered. It was like pointing a telescope at the nidus of perturbations in space and locating a new planet. The whole of masonry, the sequence of symbolism pointed in this one direction, led to no other inference, would have added QED to no other solution of the problem. For seven years, I have been making careful observations of the orbit and movements of the new star on my horizon and been rewarded by assurance, confirmation, satisfaction, and higher aspiration. Good men and women seem so often discouraged and bewildered over the experiences of life. To the everlasting question, what does it all mean? Often comes the discouraged and discouraging answer, nobody knows how to adjust the vicissitudes of life and to utilize its varying experiences so as to become master of the results upon ourselves that is the royal secret, the great work, facing as we must principalities and powers, things present and things to come and life and death and yet to remain serene, steadfast and full of good cheer is the great secret. Does this not imply a mental attitude, a, a way of looking at things, a method of living, a, an assurance that we are on the right path and a conviction that all is well? and the goal secure. Masonry is a great school designed and qualified to educate every initiate in just this science of life. What else is the meaning of the instructive tongue, the listening ear and the faithful breast? What else can it be to be made a Mason in the heart? Is not that an expression of reality and sincerity? What else can the expression by being a man mean? Certainly not a coward, a slave, a fanatic or an imbecile. Test the noblest characters of all time by these principles and these standards and see if they are not revealed. This is the great school of masonry coming down through the ages, whether one student in a thousand graduates and makes good or not. The infallible Pope says we are atheists and do not believe in God. He knows better. No man can pass to the altar of masonry who does not believe in God, as two million American masons will testify. Freemasonry is aligned with eternal truth, liberty, charity, and fraternity, and it lies squarely across the pathway of all who would enslave the human soul. And there it will stand so long as God is in the heavens until time shall be no more. Murder, as Rome has often tried to do, every Freemason on earth today and not one of its principles, its priceless jewels, would be changed or lost. You might as well try to destroy the principles of light, electricity or gravitation. One of the relics preserved for pious Catholics in the East, we are told, is a bottle containing the darkness that fell upon Egypt. If his infallible holiness should look upon this bottle, he would undoubtedly behold his own image reflected there, with his swarm of Italian cardinals hovering like locusts in the background, and his bottle of darkness would indeed prove a boomerang. What Egypt was in its glory, when the great masters instituted its paternal government and built the rock beside the water. 
America may yet become, if every Mason is true to his landmarks and his traditions, and to the fathers who instituted them here, what Egypt is today, America will become a waste of sand and howling jackals if the same priestcraft and paganism that triumphed there are allowed here to destroy our free schools and reunite church and state. The issues are exceedingly plain and as old as the human race on this earth. Since the lost word may be discovered in the great work the designs upon the trestle board are restored for the first time in many a weary century. Only the listening ear and the faithful breast are required. I, for one, have listened, examined the jewel, and found the mark. Fraternally, J.D. Buck, Cincinnati, June 1911. Unveil, O thou that giveth sustenance to the universe, from whom all things proceed, to whom all must return, that face of the true sun now hidden by a vase of golden light, that we may know the truth and do our whole duty on our journey to thy sacred seat. Uh, thank you for watching, and please don't forget to share, like, subscribe, and comment. And if you can, please consider donating to Wars of the Roses. Links to PayPal and Patreon are in the description. Thank you so very much.